Okay, everybody, welcome to another DCP webinar. Um, we're going to begin now. Sounds good. Um, I want to remind everybody that this program is going to be recorded. Our goal is to archive it online with the rest of our webinars so that folks who couldn't join live can watch it later. Um, so it's best if you can keep your video off, but most important is for you to keep your microphones muted. Um, do submit your questions to the chat. And before I turn it over to Dr. Dudzinski, I just want to show you um, a little picture of our website, if, if the PowerPoint can progress. Um, like all of our dolphin lessons, uh, we're gonna give away a free dolphin adoption e-kit today, an electronic adoption kit. Um, so you can enter to win this adoption kit. Um, and there you can see a screenshot of our website. It's the Adopt a Dolphin selection under Ways to Help. And on that page, you can see all the dolphins that are available for adoption. Each one of these dolphins is an Atlantic spotted dolphin that we've observed off the coast of Bimini, which is a little island in the Bahamas. And so if you'd like to be entered into today's drawing, just submit your email address to the chat. If you have the option to choose me, Kel Sweeting, um, you can do that. Um, if you don't, and you don't mind other people seeing your email address, um, otherwise you can email it to us afterwards. Everybody who submits an email address during the webinar will be added to our email list if you're not already, and then you'll be entered into the drawing and I'll email the winner. So thank you everybody. And now I'm going to turn it over to the Director of Dolphin Communication Project, Dr. Kathleen Dudzinski. Thank you, Cal. And I I think I might actually be able to see my video. Uh, hopefully everyone can see me. Uh, I am going to remove my video in a bit so that I can defer to Annette Dempsey, who is the Director of Education and Staff Development at Blue Lagoon Island, which is home to Dolphin Encounters. And as Cal mentioned, uh, I'll be hosting this uh, webinar and chatting with Annette. Cal will be monitoring it. And as a reminder, as Cal just said, if you don't want to, um, have your video uh, restored for this chat for you know webinar on uh, YouTube and, and DCP keep your video off and send your questions to Cal uh, and we'll go forward so with that I have Annette's first slide and you'll see that uh, in her video I'm going to try to jump back and forth between my sharing and not not sharing uh, and, and we'll 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 do that um, and I wanted to show Annette and introduce her. And Annette is the Director of Education and Staff Development at Blue Lagoon Island. Uh, if you'd like to say a few things, Annette, and we can go back to the slides after. Okay. Welcome, everybody. I just want to give you a view of this beautiful place. This is Blue Lagoon Island. It's located just about three miles off of Nassau. The facility is quite large. It's about 100 acres. Sorry, uh, it's, about, it's a little bit larger than the size of a football field. Uh, there's about uh, 35 feet of water, and we have dolphins, sharks, rays, and sea lions. We'll talk a little bit more about the animals today. Thank you, Annette. Uh, could you, I know that you just talked about what Blue Lagoon Island is. Can you share a little bit about um, the history or where Blue Lagoon Island is? Well, Blue Lagoon is located three miles off of New Providence, which is the central capital of the Bahamas. Um, we take a 25 minute boat ride every day to this beautiful location. Uh, and th this island is owned actually by a single local family. And they wanted to create this beautiful marine paradise for not just locals, but also for international guests to really enjoy the beauty of the Bahamas and all the wildlife that we have here. Very cool. And I, um, I applaud you for your uh, social distancing and your, your beautiful yes. mask there. Uh, did you make that? Uh, no, it was made locally uh, by cool. a woman in my, in my neighborhood. Um, the Bahamas is, in, uh, is um, encouraging local production for things that it can in this time of distress. So all of the um, non-medical uh, masks are being made locally. Very cool. And and just to let you know, you are being somewhat photobombed for, for oh. folks who might be seeing that. There are some dolphins behind you that are surfacing to breathe, etc. Uh, I don't know if you wanted to stay there for a bit for maybe a couple questions, or would you like me to um, 
you know, give you another question if you're going to chat by the dolphins or um, let's, I should. Let's, should, I should let's, let's do one more question and then we'll head down so that you can see the dolphins in the background. Okay. Well, um, how long has Dolphin Encounters been at Blue Lagoon Island? Well, the gentleman who bought the island, he bought it in 1979, and then in 1989, it opened as Dolphin Encounters. We did have a major expansion in 1995, uh, where it's the current size it is now. Uh, we currently have 27 dolphins, and 23 of them were born. Awesome. Very cool. And, and, uh, I, I will, as you're making your way towards the dolphins, I will pull up a screen that you had that you sent to us. So I can pull that in. I'm, I'm juggling here between the screens and going forward. And I wanted to ask you, uh, could pirates have ever stayed on Blue Lagoon Island? Most definitely. Uh, this is actually an island that was well known for pirates and privateers alike because the original name was Salt Key. There was a salt lagoon in the middle um, a, more of a salt marsh, and they would pull the salt and use it for a preservative. Very cool. And that was in the 1800s. So that was just before the island was bought in 1856. Oh, very cool. Very cool. So uh, when I went to the slides, it shows this, the slide that we have here is, uh, I think, one of the outlines of Blue Lagoon Island, which also shows a bit of the Customs House and McCutcheon Tower. And I say that because I can't tell where you are because of course my video is gone a little bit. <laughs> so uh, I didn't know if there's anything you wanted to say any more about um, that history and uh, you know what was going on maybe in World War II. Oh, well, the island when it was brought back uh, in the 1850s, it transpired hands a couple times. It was only 35 pounds when it was sold the first time. Uh, in the process, the McCutcheon family they used it as a family summer camp reserve. And so the map that you see is the one that they generated for their family. They had the tower built in 1951. It's a historical treasure of itself. And then um, uh, in 19, oh, I think it was about 1916, they actually had the customs house where people came onto the island to buy the salt. And that was their drawbridge where you had to access the drawbridge in order to get onto the island. Very cool. Very cool. I like that. So I'm going to I'm going to show my video again because I think that seems to bring maybe some videos up and I can show that. Um, and uh, I'm not sure um, where you are. Uh, you have we do have on the screen as you're as you're getting into position again, the um, island habitat slide. So you can see the ferry for those of you watching the screen here, you can see the ferry that takes folks to the island from uh, from um, uh, New Providence or in Paradise Island, that area. And you, you see the lower photo is um, dolphin in, is uh, dolphin encounters where the dolphins are, the ferries in the upper. And then you can see where my cursor is, you can see a little bit right there of the tower, which is pretty cool, uh, the McCutcheon Tower. So I'm not sure where you are right at the moment, Annette, but we see your video again, which is pretty cool. Well, I am in the middle of the dolphin facility in what we call the maternity pool because we currently have four moms and four babies, which you may see crews behind me to check things out. Very cool. I love it when dolphins photobomb you. <laughs> so uh, then let me, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to go off the slide just for one second so that we can see a little bit more of you in the background there. And how many dolphins do you guys have there? We currently have 27 Atlantic bottlenose dolphins. Uh, 23 of them have been born here. The real original animals were collected in the area of the Abaco Bahamas. Uh, and from those animals, we've raised all the rest of the babies, of which you see cruising behind me right now. Very cool. And how many generations of dolphins do you have there? Uh, we're actually on our third generation. So the three, three of the four moms behind me were actually born here. That would be Sofa, go. Miss Merlin, and, uh, and maybe uh, Abaco. Yeah. And they have their three calves in the pool 
uh, in, of which I tell you that we're looking for a new flag sometime in the month of May. We'll be having international you're freezing just a little bit. Could you re repeat what the last thing you just said? Uh, we have one baby whose name has not been decided as of yet. Oh. So the month of May will be an international competition that we'll uh, put on our social media and as far as Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, where you'll have an opportunity to vote on the last baby's names. We, uh, we wait to make sure that we know which sex the baby is. Even okay. though we do a lot of ultrasounds, we still like to make sure that the name is the right, the right choice when we make it. Awesome. Well, we'll have to we'll have to include the social media information for people to potentially vote on the name. So um, great. And and who? Uh, this is just a question um, that I'd be curious to share. Is who's your oldest dolphin there? Uh, well, the fourth mom that's in the pool behind me. Her name is Princess, and she's our oldest animal. She's currently 52 years of age. Um, wow. The thing is about dolphins, uh, under human care, the average lifespan right now is about 28 years. But in the wild, it's significantly less than that. So even though Princess's age is, is uh, almost uh, double what it would be average under human care, it's still significantly greater than it would be in the wild. And that's because of the great health care that she gets. Very cool. Well, along those lines, can you talk a little bit about the health care that the dolphins get and maybe also something about what they eat? Well, first off, uh, we have to feed the dolphins really healthy, quality, human-grade food. We go through thousands of pounds of it every single month. So it's commercially fished in areas where those types of fish are abundant. And then we ship it into the Bahamas frozen. And this is what most marine mammal facilities do. The Bahamas does not have enough fish that are locally prevalent for us to do that. So we want to make sure we're using sustainable fisheries. Um, as far as the types of fish right now, we're feeding mullet, uh, soury, um, herring, um, and sometimes capelin. Um, so it's a real diverse diet because these animals are coastal dolphins and they're known for eating um, fish and also some um, bottom dwelling invertebrates. And no matter where they live in the world, they're going to change their diet to what's locally available. Well, you're you're in a natural lagoon there. Do the dolphins ever eat the fish in the pools there? The natural. I mean, I'm assuming there's naturally occurring fish there, right? There is. There's quite a bit. But the fact is, is when you want to go fishing, usually people do it for entertainment and not necessarily for their diet. And the animals are pretty much the same way. They can earn all their food through their their programs and their sessions with their trainers. They can go fishing if they want to, but it's not as much fun when you're when you're when you're doing it for entertainment to try to catch your food for the whole day. So they can fish in the in the pools if they want to, but in many cases, um, they might just use the fish for entertainment. You know, suck them in, spit them out, suck them in, spit them out. Cool. Well, do dolphins drink water? Uh, they don't need to, not like us, but they do need fresh water, and they actually get it from the fish that they eat. The fish that they eat is actually um, entertainment <laughs> right there, right? Yes. <laughs> and that's called playing with water. That's very entertaining when you're a baby. Yes. So um, the fish that they eat is about 70% water. So when they metabolize the fish, it frees up the water for their body. Dolphins and other marine mammals have a really cool kidney with lots of loops that help concentrate, remove the salt, so it gives them the fresh water they need for survival. Very cool. Well, how, I, I mean, I'm assuming that you're being photobombed and that's pretty fun there. And, and your trainers though, they have, I'm sure they have fun with the dolphins each day, but can you, can you talk a little bit about how they might communicate with the dolphins or, or what their day-to-day -day might be like? Well, the animals are a little bit like kids. They're gonna think that your job is to entertain them. So <laughs> it's, really, it's really based on your perspective. So the first thing that we want to do as trainers is we want to use a method called targeting. And that's where the animal touches and follows a target, like maybe the tips of my fingers. And when they do that correctly, they're going to receive a reward. So a trainer is going to think about what they want to train. And then they're going to put the target in front of the animal. And if the, tar if the target moves in the way that creates that natural motion, the 
trainer is going to then reward. And they'll continue to build the behavior step by step. Uh, each time that you learn to write a letter using an activity with dotted lines, you know, where you traced on the page mm -hmm. uh, until you knew your letters, that's what targeting is like. It's about reproducing that behavior many, many times so that when the lines disappear, you know how to write the letter. So when a trainer is finished training a behavior, the only thing they have to do is to give the signal and then the dolphin knows exactly the behavior that the trainer wants. Is it hard to train new behaviors? Uh, it's like a good teacher in school. If you have a good teacher, they know exactly what they're doing because they know what the students need to learn. They break it down into bits and pieces and they adjust their training for each of the students. So it just depends upon how good of a teacher you are. If you've got a good plan and you're patient, uh, it's not that hard of a job at all. Very cool. Well, would you say that dolphins, based on some of the, the funny actions I was seeing behind you, would you say that dolphins have distinct personalities? Yes, because, you know, the animals themselves, they're a lot like us in that they all have their own unique histories. They all have their favorite things they like to do. They have their favorite friends that they like to play with. Um, it's more like a dolphinality. So it's unique to being a dolphin. Um, what trainers do is we teach them all sorts of different behaviors that bring out their personality and help create um, a, a sense of excitement and enthusiasm makes the animals very inquisitive. And because the animals are going out there and exhibiting more of their natural behaviors, it's all because of the training that the trainers inspired the animals through just daily sessions. Very cool. Did you have, um, I'm assuming that you've also done a little bit of training with the dolphins, is that correct? Uh, yes, I've been a trainer for 25 years with dolphins and sea lions and stingrays and a variety of different animals. And I've do taught you, trainers, trainers how to be trainers for many of those years. Very cool. Do you have a particular behavior you like to train or you like to work with, or does it vary by dolphin? I think it's going to vary by the animal because some personalities are going to have different challenges with different behaviors. So, for example, I really like working with sea lions because they're very agile. They're very acrobatic. They, they move very quickly, so you really have to be on your toes. Um, with a dolphin, I mean, it, anything is, is, is different. So when you're trying to train something creative, that's a lot of fun. Um, let's say you want the animal to go get an object. That becomes very easy at first, but then when you ask the animal to have to go get a natural object, it takes a while for the animal to really figure out what the heck you're talking about because you really can't tell them specifically what you want. So those behaviors that, that require the animal to guess a little bit more, that's where it really kind of becomes a challenge and that's where it's fun. Very cool. Well, we, I, I noticed we had a question um, and I actually forgot to ask it early on is, how do you tell each of the individual dolphins apart? Well, each of them is, is unique in, and then the major features that you're gonna look for that are gonna stand out for you right away. The first thing is gonna be the shape of the dorsal fin, um, not just the overall shape, but what the edge on it looks like in the back. Then you're probably gonna look at the animal's face to look at what their lower chin and their face kind of looks like. Um, the, sec the, the next part in the face is gonna be the stripes that cover the, the, the face, it's kind of like a mask. Those are gonna be independent and different. If the animal rolls over and shows you off their pink and white belly, you're gonna see freckles, you're gonna see different amount of, of pink and gray and blotches. Um, and if you get down to the genital area, that's gonna be your way for you to tell too if it's a male or a female dolphin based on how many slits you see. If you spend some time with us, you'll actually be able to use their behaviors to tell them apart because they, they spend different times in different parts of the pool and they have different friendships. So over time, you can use some of the behavioral characteristics to tell them apart. Very cool. Let me ask, Cal, do we have any, uh, any other questions that I've missed that have come in from, from any of the chat folks? Um, so far, um, it was mainly questions about how to tell them apart. Um, right. And then I think there we also might have some questions about, oh, 
a big leap back there um, <laughs> about how they interact with each other. Do the dolphins get along? Um, well, just like all, oh, I'm getting wet here. Yeah, just I was going to say. Just like all animals, they have their own social relationships. And what we do is we try to make those as positive as possible. So you might go to school and there might be somebody who's really shy and there might be a bully. And so we teach the animals to trust each other, to work as teams. And what that also does, it decreases the likelihood of bullies. Um, we also change the animals around so they get more than, than just one BFF because it's important that they have multiple friends. And so most of the pools are gonna be somewhere between three to six or seven dolphins that get along well with each other. And we can always change those around if we need to. Dolphin societies are actually quite dynamic in the wild. So they change the, the, the group content in an area quite flexibly during the course of the year. Very cool. Thank you. We also have a question about what you know about how your dolphins sleep. Ooh, that's a good one. Okay, well, when we go to sleep, we can allow our bodies to regulate our breathing and we're gonna be fine. With a dolphin, if the dolphin was to go underwater and completely fall asleep, and if it would try to breathe air, it would drown. So a dolphin's body is designed to regulate its breathing in a different way. It only puts half of its brain to sleep at a time so that the other half can keep the bodily functions running. So it might come up to the surface and take a, a bob and take a breath and then sink back down. It might swim, um, it might go down to the bottom and rest in a particular spot for a long period of time. Or it might have this continuous swim pattern where it circles and it continues to breathe. But regardless, the, the animal continues to have to have half of its brain asleep and half awake so that it controls its breathing and it never gets to the point where it has the potential to drown. Very cool. We also had another question that came in. Uh, how long are dolphins pregnant for? And I would add also how many babies or calves do they have at one time? Uh, that's another good question. Well, what, since you've got so many babies behind me to show off, um, basically, we have our dolphins go into season about twice a year. It's usually spring and fall. During that time, we pick who breeds with who because we want to make sure we have healthy babies and we avoid inbreeding. Um, we can see the baby inside mom by ultrasound at about 50 days of age and it would be about the size of the fingernail on my pinky. When the baby comes out, it's about 25 pounds, um, and it's gonna stay with its mom for about two years uh, while it's nursing. Um, just like the milk commercial, milk is good for strong bones and teeth, and we know that dolphins need that milk from their mom. Um, if the baby is interested in training, we'll add fish into the diet, but we'll keep a nice balance of the milk from the mom and the fish in the training. Um, in the wild, they found that some dolphin moms have learned that it's smarter to feed your dolphin calf for longer, up to six years even, because they not only nurse the calf, but they actually teach the calves really important things like how to find food and how to avoid predators. Very cool. We also had um, a couple of other questions that came in is, um, can the dolphins understand you when you speak? and do they respond to their names? Oh, good marine mammal question. Okay, well, first of all, our dolphins, they do have an external uh, opening to their ear like us. It's about two inches behind their eye, but they don't have an external ear to gather sounds, but their brains over time have been really designed to hear sounds that travel underwater. And sounds that travel underwater travel two and a half times faster than they do in the air. So that would mean if you were watching a Charlie Brown commercial, uh, 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 like a cartoon, and you heard the parents talk, do you remember what they sound like? I do, the wah, wah, wah. That's right, the adults always sound like wah, 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 wah. <laughs> so I would probably compare what a dolphin hears above the surface to that because we sound like we're talking super slow as compared to the sounds that they're used to hearing underwater. And if you put us underwater, we're the exact opposite. 
we can hear really great in the air, but not really well underwater because the sounds are coming too fast for our brain to figure out even what direction they came from. So the big answer to your question is dolphins hear really well underwater, but not very good in the air. But they live most of their life underwater, so that's most beneficial for them. So that means when we talk to them, they really don't get those individual words. Um, we can't call them by name. Um, but the exact opposite is true with our sea lions because they're designed to be talking and listening in the air very much like us. So we can actually use the names to call the sea lions. And um, we can rely on verbal signals for the behaviors in addition to the hand signals. With the dolphins, we talk to them only with our hands. And that's a sign language that we make up here at the facility. Very cool. Well, I think we have time for one more question, if that's okay with you, Annette. That would be great. I'm working on my tan. Uh, awesome. Well, how do dolphins keep predators away? Oh, that's a good question. Well, of course, here under at Dolphin Encounters, they don't have any predators that they have to worry about. But out there in the wild, they can do a couple different things. First of all, they have really good hearing. So they could hear a predator coming from quite a long distance. They also have something called echolocation, and that allows them to make sounds underwater. And when those sounds bounce off objects, it gives them a, a mental picture of what's in front of them. Now, if that was a shark or some other kind of predator, they could, if, they if they got that information, they could leave before the predator got there. The other thing is when the uh, predator is in really short distance and they have to defend themselves, the dolphin has a really, really powerful tail. The muscle that runs from the dorsal fin all the way to the flukes is called the peduncle, and it's super strong. So the dolphin could actually use their tail to whack a predator, or if they really needed to, they could spear a predator using that elongated jaw. Particularly with a the shark, they're going to they're gonna try to hit the shark in the gills along the side of the neck, and that's where the shark would breathe. So that would give the dolphin a chance to escape if they had to. Very cool. Very cool. Well, thank you. I appreciate all of the, the answers and the information you've shared with us today, as well as the photo bombing that you've had going on, which well, is pretty baby, cool. The, the babies and the moms do get quite bored. Um, <laughs> they all like to have a little bit more activity. But of course, for everybody's safety, it's pretty much on the quiet side out here at Blue Lagoon Island for a little bit longer. Very cool. Well, very good for the safety bits. So I'm going to go back into sharing the last couple of slides so that um, Kel and I can share with our viewers some of the details, uh, if I can remember to, to share my screen properly and go through some of that again. Um, so we had, these are just some photos that Annette shared with us so that um, you guys can see some of the different programs that they have ongoing at uh, Blue Lagoon Island, not just with the dolphins, but with their sharks and their sea lions and their stingrays. As well as, I love the slide, Annette, that you shared of the dolphin babies. You can see these, the individuals here, and you can see the young animals have these lines from being folded up inside mom, and they stretch out a little bit as um, the calf grows. And then there's a variety of husbandry behaviors that are ongoing with the dolphins as well to make sure that they're healthy and that they get their physical exam. Dolphins and sea lions, is this true, Annette, are some of the only animals that regularly volunteer in their health care? Oh, absolutely. All of our animals have voluntary behaviors. Um, most of our animals have better health care than 90% of people in the entire world. And that includes maternity, paternity, dental, um, voluntary ultrasounds, you can do x-rays. Um, all of those things that's preventative health care are just as important as being able to treat an animal when, when they do get ill. Very cool. And then also one of the things we didn't chat about, and you, but you're showing here, is that um, all of the animals at Blue Lagoon Island seem to like to play. And they paint and they uh, blow bubbles or they toss balls around. That's right. The animals are, uh, enjoy play. All animals play is a very important aspect uh, for social skills, um, for uh, learning problem solving. And sometimes it's just for the healthy activity of it and the physical activity. So with the, the painting, 
um, with their sea lions and our dolphins. Of course, they're going to come up with whatever colors and whatever designs that they want. Um, mm -hmm. All the monies from uh, any of the art that's sold support the 100% uh, research that's conducted in the Bahamas, like Dolphin Communication Project, for example. Um, and then we also do some things where we teach the animals how to play games like the, the team ball toss. Um, and then they come up with their own games. So you can see that picture of the dolphin blowing a bubble underwater. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll watch them on their own and they'll do different things with bubble rings. Like they might take two bubble rings and use their rostrum to join them together. Or they might blow a bubble ring and then try to swim through it before it gets to the surface. So it's, it's all very much individual, but we... We can inspire their creativity by getting them to be comfortable in their environment. We call that desensitization. Very cool. And then you have some other, you've shared a little bit of some of the other terrestrial wildlife on the island, which is pretty neat. I didn't actually realize all the different animals you had there, which is pretty cool. You do have to look closely, but they are all out there. Um, this is a, a, a special type of forest habitat. There are very few larger animals, but the smaller animals compete for all the resources and create a balance in this environment. So it's really neat to explore. Very cool. And some diverse plants as well, which is neat. That's right. So I mean, there's um, in the Bahamas, there's a combination of fruit plants and flowering plants that create a habitat that's healthy for animals, but it's also also healthy for people. And so we're, we try very hard to remove invasive species so that these native species flourish in their place. Very neat. Well, that, and then we're on, we're on your last slide where you can see a really cool picture of a dolphin with your thank you, Annette, which, which I appreciate very much. Uh, uh, do you have any, any last comments you'd like to share? Well, we enjoy having everybody visit us virtually, and we hope that sometime in the future you'll be able to come to see your animals here on Blue Lagoon Island, or maybe come on another virtual uh, field trip and see what kind of exciting things that the animals are learning. Very exciting. Thank you, Annette. Thank you. And then we have just a couple of DCP reminders before you go. If you go to the DCP website under the Education tab, you will find all of our list of webinars. And this particular webinar from today will be uploaded by tomorrow morning on uh, the DCP website, as well as on our YouTube channel. And we have all of our previous webinars available for folks to listen to, uh, to share, to go back to. Uh, Cal, do you want to add anything more to this? Um, no, I would just say in particular, if folks are interested in kind of a, a basic introduction to dolphins. If you didn't catch our dolphin lesson intro to dolphins, that's a good one to start with. And then a lot of the questions centered around how to tell the dolphins apart. So we also have a dolphin lesson on photo ID, particularly of the wild dolphins we study here in Bimini. And thankfully the adoption programs, which I think, um, well, we have uh, some different, different ways of the educational content that you can get involved in, listening to the Dolphin Pod, which is available from our website as well. Our next webinars, we have one on Thursday, which is a deep dive into uh, dolphin creativity that uh, Dr. Heather Hill will be joining us and chatting about. And then we have another dolphin lesson scheduled for next Tuesday, which will have details on our website about. But also, um, there's a variety of different ways that you can support DCP. And uh, our Adopt a Dolphin program is one of them. Would you like to share a little bit about that, Cal? Um, sure. Um, you can adopt a wild dolphin, like I said, from our Bimini study group. And those come in hard copy kits and electronic kits. So the one we're giving away today is an electronic kit. So that comes to you in PDFs. Both kits have videos that you can go online and stream, certificates, information about the dolphins. Um, and right now, if you do any of the, the three, the t first three things listed there, so you adopt a dolphin, or you become a member, or make a donation, or you buy a, a t-shirt or a, a bandana who rag, mm -hmm. um, every $15 that you spend on any of those items, you can choose someone to receive an electronic adoption kit. So 
we couldn't think of a whole lot of ways DCP could help essential workers mm -hmm. or people feeling down um, because of this crazy pandemic, but we realized we can give away electronic adoption kits. Um, so if you make any support of DCP in those ways, you can choose people in your life to receive those kits. Um, and then uh, further down, you can also see how to stay in touch with us. So our website, if we've mentioned full of info, our email, if you have questions that you think of later. And of course, you can find us on social media, um, which we're, we're trying to get better at. Um, so thank you all for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. And, and thank you to Blue Lagoon Island as well. And of course, to the dolphins. So thanks. Have Thank a great you, day. Everybody. Thank you.